Hi guys, welcome to the Coffee Break Interview Video Podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan Ho, and I'm your host today. Today we have a very, very special guest, the legendary dental consultant Sandy Pardu. Sandy Pardu is an internationally recognized lecturer, author, practice management consultant. She has assisted hundreds of doctors with practice expansions and team development over the past 25 years. She is known for her comprehensive and interesting approach to dental office systems and offers a refreshing point of view on how to become more efficient and productive in a dental practice. Dentistry Today magazine has recognized Sandy as a leader in consulting for the past 15 years. Sandy, it's such an honor to have you on this video podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I could not wait for this time today. You know what? I'm super, super excited fun. too. Yeah, because I think we tried to coordinate for this interview since last year, right? I think for uh, there's been a couple of times, but you know, I stay busy with consulting, but also we do a lot of seminars. Yeah. So that, that really, you know, when you're, and I lecture around the country, so I'm, a, I'm just about ready to leave for Virginia Yeah. and uh, after the holiday and then going over to Jackson, Mississippi and uh, yeah, Washington DC. And then I'll be in Ohio and then uh, I'll be in yeah. Missouri. So all of that before Thanksgiving. So yeah. Wow, you you sound like you're a b- busy woman, and uh, and also I heard that you've been creating a lot of training videos as well, right? Oh yes, yes. In fact, that's what we were doing yesterday, and uh, we're you know what we're working on that's so exciting is front desk training, and um, the phone specifically the telephone, because over the years I was actually recording phone calls before it was cool to record phone calls. Okay. I I was doing that back in, in the eighties and, um, way before anybody ever thought about doing it. And so I have a lot of experience with what works and what doesn't work and why people aren't coming back and how team members upset patients. And so we are doing a nice course just on phone skills. I'm super excited and we're doing it all day tomorrow. We're filming again. So that's awesome. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions today, but uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I really appreciate you for being a member in dental win-win Facebook group and offer your, Mm -hmm. your great advice on there to to help other dentists. I love it. That's what I live for. I'm truly passionate about helping dentists and I've been doing it for a long time and I just couldn't imagine uh, not doing it. I, I love it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. So uh, I know you're a very well-known dental consultant in the dental industry, but for some dentists that haven't heard about you, can you take a couple minutes to tell us about your journey in dentistry and sure. as, well as, as well as how you became a dental consultant? Okay. That sounds great. Well, you know, I, I always wanted to be a teacher and that's actually what I, I thought I would, I would do. I went to LSU here in Baton Rouge. And um, then I got married and uh, had my daughter, Dana, who is our, C- our COO here at Classic Practice. She's working on her MBA and she is, does a fantastic job and uh, really proud of her and proud to work with her. And uh, she is speaking as well. So you'll, you'll be seeing and hearing a lot more about Dana coming up. Yeah. But uh, I stayed home with her for five years and I thought, you know, I, I had I had a friend who had a friend that was a dentist and thought, well, you know what, if I could uh, work for this particular practice, I think I would like to, to go check that out maybe as a manager. So this was in 1985. So back in 1985, the economy was not so good. And um, a lot of people were looking for a job. So there were like 70 applicants for this position. And I got the job. So working in this practice that people were literally traveling from around the world to see this practice. Mm -hmm. People were coming from Japan, Australia, I mean, everywhere. So there was this dentist that had, you know how everybody now talks about systems and they talk about um, having things written up and they talk about checklists. Oh, it's so cool. Well, he had all that in 1985. So wow. I literally walked in there and there was a shelf, a bookshelf. And I recently saw a picture of this bookshelf and I was standing at a podium about 1999 giving seminars. 
And uh, I'm sorry, did I say 99? I meant 89, 1989. It dates back to there. And all of those binders just filled with everything that every position needed to do and say in the dental office. Mm. Back then, pictures of tray setups, everything already done. So I was very fortunate to walk into that environment and work for a dentist that was just a leader, a natural born leader. And he really took me under his wing and I just sucked it up. So I learned a lot from him. So I learned a lot about relationships uh, with people, with employees. Uh, I learned definitely how uh, to, to build the schedule and make it productive and train people to do it. I literally had a room like this is my conference room. This is where I give lectures and train. But I will tell you, I had a room like this in his office uh, wow. with tables. And I, my office was to the side. And I would call in the team members throughout the day and train them and listen and to like the recordings that we had done, phone calls that we recorded and listen and critique and make them better and better and keep statistics. How many, how many patients did they talk to? How many did they schedule? What worked? What didn't work? And we recorded for 15 years. We recorded every call and then we hired a group to listen to them and come up with the real patient objections and why people don't accept and why people break appointments. And he told me, I was young, very young, and he, I believed everything he said. He said, Sandy, broken appointments are not normal. Mm. And you need to go back there and figure out why they happen. Mm. And I went, okay. <laughs> and, and, and back then, I mean, and we started gathering the data. What people said when they were being confirmed, if they broke an appointment, we'd go back and listen to that call certain things they would ask and say would end up being a broken appointment. So you see, there's, there's a lot to all of this practice management. It's not just hearing these little things yeah. and trying them. So there's a little psychology involved in it as well. So we, we got all this figured out early on. And so this particular doctor, so back in 85, he was doing 1.2 million. Well, that's not much today. But when he sold his practice six years ago, he was doing 2.8 in collections solo. So that wow. just gives you an idea. And here's the real kicker. He was 75 years old with four full-time hygienists and doing those kinds of numbers with no marketing, not ever 90 to 100 units of Crown and Bridge a month with his own in-house lab. So, so that just gives you an idea of the type of practice. So it was a relationship built bread and butter practice. So I managed when I got there, there were 18 team members. Of course, through the years as, as we were one of the first practices in the country uh, to be scheduling on a computer. And as we automated things, of course, we didn't need as many team members. So 14 team members collecting 2.8 million. So wow. throughout this whole time, we had training systems, systems for everything, 42 systems. That's what every practice needs, 42 systems. And so every, within each one of those systems, I always say, because I'm from the South, okay, and so you know, and I know you like to cook too. So in the South, we have recipes, right? That's right. So you got to have a recipe for everything you do, just everything in the practice. So this applies to the, to the dental office too. So when I go on vacation, I have a checklist for my vacation. I don't mm. think every year when we go to the beach, we spend a week at the beach. I'm not thinking, what do I need to bring? I just pull out my checklist, right? It saves a lot of uh, time and energy, right? And, and brain That's cells. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's how you have to think. You do it one time. You organize it, and then you have it. So there's 42 systems. So within each one, things are written up. And, you know, you hear a lot of cliches and platitudes in dentistry. I, you know, when I'm on Facebook and I'm watching all these things being said, it's just kind of, okay, really? Where's the meat? You know, that's why I'll say when, you know, I'll always say, well, how do you do that? Get, you know, bring it out and teach the dentist so they can have yeah. something to go implement. Where's yeah. the meat? And so, you know, that's what happens when you look at systems. You hear, you got to have systems. Well, really, what is a system? When you have systems, real systems, because not every system is a good system, they're talking to one another. They're mm. speaking to one another. If you have a scheduling system and an account system and a confirmation system, when one of those falls out, just one part of that falls out, 
it doesn't go undetected for very long because yeah. they're talking to each mm. other. Yeah, like a network. Yeah. Yes, and it's a domino effect. Yeah. If something falls out. So that's when you know you have the good system. So it's in writing. When people ask the doctor questions, team members shouldn't be running up to the doctor asking them how to do things. That should yeah. never happen. Why isn't it in writing? Why isn't there a training protocol? Why didn't they get trained on it? So, yeah, that's, it's really easy. You know, when you look at leadership, and, and I'll tell you some of the biggest problems that, that I see in practices is that the lack of leadership. But then that's another thing you hear all over Facebook and all out there. It's like, oh, you have to be a leader. <laughs> well, there's a lot more to it than that. You know, it starts with that practice owner, right? That yeah. leadership. Yeah. And uh, if it's lacking, nothing moves forward. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's it's why. Done. Yeah. That's why I love to do uh, this kind of podcast because I. Uh, I'm able to transfer knowledge from 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 oh, experts like yourself, yeah, to other dentists yeah. out there, right? And so today I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about systems, okay. leadership, patient experience. So you helped a lot of uh, dentists uh, or, or practice owners with their practice expansions mm -hmm. and team developments over the past 25 years. Can you tell us what makes the thriving practices different from the average ones? Sure. I know. Do you like to watch football? I love to watch are football. Or any kind of sports? I love What football. Makes so many teams? Oh, they they have a great team players, great coach, and I think they have a, a great system as well. Yeah. That's right. So when you look at a dental office, you know, I'm going to tell you something. Okay, so so this is something I've been saying for years. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to say it, and if you hear it repeated, you just remember it came from Sandy. Okay. Okay. The only thing that matters in a practice is what occurs within those four walls of that practice. That's all that matters. Now, that's a very profound statement when you start thinking about it. Yeah. You could take an office. Let's take our founder's office. 2.8 million with practices all around him within blocks Or, or even a mile, not even doing half of that, maybe yeah. 25% of that. Yeah. So it wasn't the address or the street, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you've mm -hmm. got 10 practices within a mile mm. and one only has the dentistry to, do, to work one day a week or maybe a day and a half, uh, one decided that they would go work for a corporate uh, organization because they just couldn't get new patients. Um, another one with three or four staff members, another one trying to hire everybody from that co-founder of this company to, you know, all the, his team. Oh, because I'll be successful if I hire those team members. Right. And that's yeah. just not the case. So yeah. what is it that would make one practice do two or three times the, the collections? Well, I'll mm -hmm. tell you, what happens within the four walls of that practice. Mm. It's not the clouds over the sky. Mm. It's not the address. It's not any of those things. And where does it start? It starts with the practice owner, always, always. But when you mm. have a team, your favorite sports team, which I love sports, and I know I love sports because I love management. I love it and practice management. But it's so easy. It's so simple. When you look and you see a, a team that's winning, it's not because they're lucky. It has nothing to do with luck. It has everything to do with who recruited the team members, the practicing, getting everybody on the same page, right? Yes. And making sure that everybody stays ethical and they're doing what they're supposed to do. And then they, the results are good. And so it, it's so basic. So if, I, if we, if I get people that call me for a lot of reasons, not everybody wants more money. You know, a lot of people call us for systems and organization because they're stressed, they're, they've grown, you know, and then of course somebody might call and say, look, I know we could be doing better. Of course, you always do better when you get organized. Everything gets better. Stress goes down, more income comes in. That's just the way it is. But 
when you're talking about a practice, that leader, and when you talk about leadership, really, it starts with establishing the practice, laying a foundation that can be built off of. And it starts with discipline. So, you know, what comes first? I'll tell you, you, you get your building, right? Your building and your equipment and your supplies. Now you better think about establishment. Who's going to work in my office? And what will their jobs be? What types of personalities do I need for each position? Because you got to be thinking about that. And then once you have that, I'm calling that established, now you find the personalities that you plug into those areas and you nourish them, and you train them, and you, you acknowledge them, and you create an environment and culture that people love to work in, where they can win and learn. It's really that easy. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really that easy. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, I could write a book on some of the faults that I see that are so easy to fix, yeah. you know? It could be somebody that signs up for consulting and they don't bring themselves to, to come get what they paid for. <laughs> you know, it's like it could be, it could be um, you know, a doctor that wants to send his team members instead of him. That's never a good sign. Yeah. It takes the entire team. Now, and then what does another dentist fall into, which is lack of leadership? Uh, you could have this all. I see it all the time where the team member they have, they will not confront that the team member's not doing a good job and they keep them too long. That's a huge problem, a huge yeah. problem, not just in dentistry, in most businesses. They're scared, they're scared to get rid of them. They're scared to fire them. They're scared to replace them. They don't know who's going to come take that position. And that, that's something, you know, like you can, here's another cliche you hear out there all the time. How does it go? Hire slow and fire fast. Is that that one that they say all the time? And I'm sitting yeah. here going, hire slow. That's the opposite of what I do. Yeah. I hire fast and fire fast. <laughs> when I say hire fast, uh, you could have a practice that needs someone at the front. Okay, I see this all the time. This scenario, yeah. it's not just one or two doctors. They need someone at the front. Because they, they don't have someone at the front, it's costing them money, hundreds and thousands of dollars every single day. But they're just running an ad and, and maybe for two months. What are they doing? They get all these resumes. No, the moment you get a resume, you get that person in. You get them in, you interview them, you ask them questions. I like the Wonderlick test. Give them the Wonderlick test. See how smart they are. If they're good, get them on there. Because I, I'll tell you, I can't even tell you how many people I've hired and fired over the years, much less trained. Yeah. You don't know there is no magic bullet to hiring. Mm -hmm. people, pe people try to get that perfect person. And you really don't know. I had this conversation earlier today. You don't know till you get them on post. Do you get them on that job? And sometimes the worst people that interview terribly make the best employees. So you don't know. You want smart people. That's another cliche that you hear. Hire loyal for loyalty. Uh, can, you, can you tell me, can, can you look at somebody and tell how loyal they are? You can't. No, you can't. no. They might be a good, inter they might be good at interviews and they can tell yeah. you everything you want to hear. But I agree, you need loyal employees, but you can't tell in an interview. So I say hire smart ones because some of the practices that I see that struggle the most have people that can't learn. They mm. cannot figure percentages. They cannot read how to do something and duplicate it. So this mm. holds back the entire practice. Yeah. So you need smart people around you. And you I know always what? say. <laughs> I yeah. agree with you on hire fast and fire fast because <laughs> one, time we had, one time we had a hygienist that walked in uh, to drop off her resume and her communication skill was exceptional. She was very presentable. She had experience. We were like, you are hired. <laughs> That's right. Let me tell you, somebody like that, she won't be available for very long. Yes. And she stayed with us for 
for I think uh, four or five years uh, until she uh, moved away to into her state. But she was there an exceptional dentist. And that's what I'm talking about. These platitudes and cliches out there in dentistry. Yeah. And then before we get into leadership, um, I know you're really big on systems. For, so for the practice owners that don't have a system in place yet, where do they start? I know, I know it's, it's easy for you, but mo- I know most practice owners uh, are having a hard time to develop a system. And sometimes if we go, with, uh, we go by trial and error, then it will take a lot of time and we, mm-hmm. we, we might waste a lot of money as well. Right. Well, the thing about systems, again, that's one of those things that's thrown out there a lot in dentistry. And, and I think it's a systems are a must. That's the only way I ever think is organization yeah. and systems. And yeah. so you can either do it yourself or you can hire somebody to do it for you. And uh, if you decide you want to go the route of doing it yourself, you start, it's, it's, it's really simple. Again, you want to think at your, we'll start with the front office. Okay. Yeah. Because Uh, The front office is the most difficult for a lot of people. But when you think of the front office, you need to think of four positions. Okay, there's there's actually four. There's receptionist or greeter, whatever you're going to call that person. Uh, The scheduling position, the insurance position, and the uh, financial coordinator position. So there's four. So if you have one person up front, you need to be thinking and in when you're organizing for four positions. So you're thinking four, right? Because you might not stay small. You might have one person now, but I hope you grow, right? Because growing, I want to be real clear about something. Growing doesn't mean stress. Yeah. No, no. Our co-founder worked. He, are you kidding? He's still seeing patients. So why? Because it doesn't stress him out. So if it stresses you out, that's, that's when you hear these dentists saying, I want to be retired by the time I'm 50 because <laughs> they can't handle it, right? Because of the stress. So yeah. the systems help you with that. So you're looking at the front office and you've got four positions. You go down to Office Depot and you buy four binders, mm. buy four binders, put a nice title on each one. I say nice because I've had people take out a marker and just write on them. No. Make a nice label because your team wants to use things that look nice. So we have a policy on how to write a policy. And I'm not kidding. Yeah. What margins we have researched. We know that the best font is Arial. It's the easiest to read. All of our policies are in Arial. And so your policy on how to write a policy talks about the format, the headers, the footers, the fonts, the titles. And so things are consistent consistent you hear me use that word a lot because Mm. consistency is the only thing that gives you predictability in life so you got your you went to office depot you got your four binders you put your label on now the next thing is you got to start making a list of everything that needs to happen at the front office so if you've got one person up front well that one person's going to have to start making that list If you've got two people, the best way to divide that is you'll have a receptionist, greeter, scheduler. Those positions go together because the first step to organizing anything is putting like things together. Okay. So then the next position would be insurance financial coordinator. So now they need to make a list of everything that happens. And that list can't happen in an hour. Uh, You know, it can't happen in a day. They need to spend at least a week on the list. When you believe that they have everything on the list, you take the list and guess what? It gets typed up and it goes in that binder. It's your first page of the binder. Mm. It's just a list. Answer the phone. Greet new patients. Update addresses. You know, whatever it is. Inactivate patients. Whatever that is on the list, it goes in there and matches the position. So sometimes as consultants, we go into a practice and you have like an office manager who's not training anyone, she's not doing her job, but she's making steric crowns. <laughs> like that goes against what we teach. It's like yeah. like things together, first step in organizing any activity. Now, the next thing you're gonna do from your list is make a checklist based uh-huh. on the items on that list. Does that make sense? 
Yes. Now we have a we have a policy on how to write a checklist, of course. Because again, I want to say this, you got to have smart people or they can't do this. You can't assign it to them if they don't have the ability. We see that so much where people just don't have the ability. Their grammar, they they can't write, they they don't know when to make a paragraph or put in a comma and if something's not written correctly, then when you give it to someone else to try to duplicate it and do the task, they can't because it was mm. written incorrectly. Okay. Yeah. So that's why it's really important to hire smart people. So now you've got your checklist, a binder with a list of duties and a checklist that matches that. The next task is to start writing everything on the checklist, how to do it. Mm. Wow. How to do it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and before you know it, you've got it done. So it's, it's just, you know, like when I go to, on vacation, the first thing I do when I say, oh, we're going to Disney World, I go out and buy a binder. <laughs> and I put a label on it that says 2018 Disneyland trip. And, and I put Mickey Mouse to make it attractive because it's fun to use. Just like yeah. your team will want something. I don't want pictures on there, but it needs to look professional. Yeah. And then um, the next thing I'm going to do is start building the, everything that we're going to do in there and activities. And I, I love sheet protectors. You know, you need sheet mm. protectors when you do this binder. It looks to be nice. You don't want pages just thrown in there. And you know, no, it needs, they need to be in sheet protectors. Wow. And uh, That's before you know, yeah, go yeah. ahead. Before you know you, before you know it, you have now when you're done with that, now the next thing you do is like we make test, like a test for the because uh, you have to plan the people you have now are probably not gonna be there in a few years. Okay. They may, yeah. but the fact is in dentistry that it's about an eighteen month average for, for turnover. So yeah. you have to plan for it. You have to plan for growth. Let's say you keep everyone on your team, but Maybe you need to hire additional team members and maybe somebody that's now doing insurance is going to move over to scheduling, that kind of thing. So you have to plan for that. You need to have yourself covered because I think one of the, the biggest reasons that doctors keep people too long is they're scared of the change. They're scared like, oh, I'm going to get somebody and they're not going to know what to do. And it's, I, I don't have time to train them. And that's what happens. Hmm. Yeah. That does sound uh, easy because uh, most most practice owners, they're busy practicing dentistry in the back, right? And mm -hmm. if their office manager is always also busy in the front or they don't know how to create a system like you just suggested, then nothing's going to happen. No. I know. That's we awesome. see it every day. <laughs> we see that every single day. So, yeah. you know, one of the first steps... Um, you talk about leadership there. You mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the first things that, that if you have a business, one of the first things as that leader that you have to do, like I said earlier, is establish your systems. And yeah. with that establishment comes dividing the duties and people knowing what's expected of them. I think the most successful practices, because I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different practices all over the country. I mean, our, our clients are in Canada, Australia, California, uh, New York City, and everywhere in between. We've worked uh, just, in fact, we were, we had a map for years where we were marking the states and just about every state we, we've worked in. And, um, and today our consultants are in four different states right now. It's the very minute. And, um, so no matter where you are in, in the, in the country, these things, cause that's another thing people say, oh, it's different in my, in my area. No, it's not. <laughs> it's really not. So the first thing that leader has to do is establish what people are, need to do in the office to get those systems ready. But the mistake they make is they have a vision for the practice and they try to tell their team where they want to go instead of involving their team. Mm. So if for those listeners out there that are thinking, you know what, I want to be a better leader. You need to ask yourself, when was the last time I sat down with my team without patience and without interruptions? That's why I like to take them away. That's why I have this course room right here is because 
when they leave their environment and they come here, they focus on their vision and their goals. One of the first things we do. And they, we, we teach them how to do it. So you say like, what is a vision? A lot of people don't know what a vision is. A lot of people don't know, understand the word purpose or goals. So you got to go through all those things. And they, when they come in here for the first time, they're shy. The team members like, Oh, where's doctor gotten us into? Let me tell you two and a half hours later, they are happy and smiling. <laughs> and yeah, I see it all the time because their doctor took the time to ask them what they thought would be good for the practice. It's amazing how people react to that in a positive way. So they yeah. want to be included. They want to be included in the journey. And so the first step of leadership is what do I need from you? So you're communicating that right to the team. This is what I need from you. And this is what we're going to do together. That's your vision. And with every vision, what a lot of people fail to do is to establish the goals that get you there. So it's great that this weekend I want to eat some boiled crabs and <laughs> I want to go sit by the river and watch the boats, right? But I also have a lot of other things I need to get done first. So my, I can have my vision. I'm sitting on the pier having a great time on Lake Pontchartrain, I can see New Orleans in the background. Wow, oh, but you know what? Uh, there's some things I have to do around the house. So, so my vision is, is out there on the water, but what's gonna get me there? My goals, my goals mm. are gonna get me there. The, the many, M-I-N-I, steps that I have to take before I have my vision, mm. right? So it might be, it could be as simple as, running errands, buying groceries, locating the crabs, getting my nails done, whatever it is, getting the car washed, you know, but those small things that get me to the vision and in practices, that's where they fail. They have a vision. The doctor has it was, didn't involve the team. When you involve the team, now they're going to be on board more likely. And now what small steps do we need to take as a team to get us to the, the vision and mm. list them out? Wow. Okay. I think, uh, I think uh, you already answered uh, the next uh, questions, but one of, uh, one of the members in the Dental Win Win Facebook group wanted me to ask you this. If you go into a, a uh, dysfunctional practice, what would be the first recommendations? Ah. Is, it is it system? Let's, let's say that the team members are not listening to doctors and the doctor has no system in place and the practice is chaos. Uh, what, what do you, well, what do you, us. Well, I, that excites me. That is so, I love the things like that. Look, I love stress. That, that's, I, that's, I love it. I love timelines and stress. Give them, give me lots of stuff to do and, and give me problems. So that kind of practice excites the heck out of me. So I'm going to go in there and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to interview those mm. employees. I'm going to find out what's going on because if you look into any activity, you might, or what people are telling you about a practice. I like facts. Okay. Mm. I'm going to, I want to interview and find out what's really happening because you know why <laughs> I can't even tell you because we're being recorded. Some of the things that I found out <laughs> after doing this, uh. not always pretty. <laughs> so, because you get down to what's really happening. So it could be that the team's not getting along. It could be the doctor has some ethics problems. It could be team has yeah. ethics problems. It's all kinds of different things. So you got to, I don't go off a of hearsay. I go totally off of facts. Mm -hmm. So I, the first thing I'm going to do is gather, I'm going to gather reports. I'm going to find out, you know, what the statistics are. I'm a big believer in you take, a job and you assign statistics to the position and then that's what you monitor and you know who who's doing what. So now I'm going to look at collections. I'm going to look at uh, outstanding insurance. I'm going to look at each area. I'm going to check hygiene. I'm going to see what procedures doctors doing. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can be going on. So it could have something to do with personality, uh -huh. but it could also have something. And oftentimes those personalities affect the missed opportunities 
in the practice with the treatment that's delivered. But first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to in interview people. And I'm going to get down to, to what's really happening in that practice with the personality. That's awesome. Uh, the, the next question is about customer service. We know that in business, customer service plays a, an important role, especially in a dental practice because most people are afraid of the dentist, right? So yeah. can you give some tips uh, 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 for dentists and the team to be able to deliver uh, great customer service, sure. uh, great patient experience uh, for the patient? First, it comes with understanding. Uh, that's another one of those platitudes that's thrown out all the time and the cliches about, oh, we got to get customer service. Well, how do you do that? Okay, everybody knows it. We're all saying it. People are, yeah. you go on Facebook, it's like, customer service, you got to give customer service. Well, what does that mean? What does yeah. that mean? Yeah. So you've got to go down to the, just the bare minimum. This is the teacher part of me because you have to realize that not everybody has the same understanding, right? It's like in general, when you, so when you have team members and you have a team and they want to do better and, and they, they really want their practice to be the best it can be. So you got to start from square one. So the first thing you're going to do is something as simple as a story. I'd like to tell you right now, because you could tell Susie that works at the front, Susie, we need to give good customer service. And Susie's going to go, yeah, I agree. <laughs> she doesn't always know how to give, she doesn't know what it means. Yeah. So about the last three weeks, I've decided that I was going to drink coffee. Okay. I haven't been a coffee person, but you know what? I thought, what the heck? I'm going to try some of this iced coffee. So I started noticing that and it's hot here, so iced tea is good too. So those two yeah. things, which brought me to go to McDonald's in the morning for iced, black iced coffee, okay? That's coffee with no cream or sugar on ice. And I realized that these three McDonald's that I pass in the morning, I would stop at three different McDonald's, okay? McDonald's, okay? Same McDonald's. <laughs> Same owner, same owner, but two of the McDonald's could not duplicate and cannot to this day duplicate what it means to have black iced coffee. Mm. So I noticed it. I would go in and say, yes, I would like a medium black iced coffee. So coffee black with no cream or sugar on ice. They can't do it. Uh. I guarantee you four out of five times it's screwed up. All right. So I go to a different McDonald's. She can't do it. She can't uh, give it to me. Yeah. I, I work here every day, ma'am. I know what that is. I get up there and it's got cream and sugar in. Uh. But this one McDonald's, it's right every time. Okay. Now this is just happening to me. Why yeah. could this possibly happen? Because it's the individual or perhaps the manager or a combination of both that makes the coffee correct, the order correct every single time. Mm. So when you're dealing with customer service, the first thing that you have to do is role play different scenarios with your team members. It has to be role played. They have to hear it and practice it. And then another thing is, and I'm certain that this happens in most practices because I'm a big retention consultant. Like that's, I have a lot of attention on recall and retention and practices because it's such a waste. And um, one thing that I'm sure of is that a lot of patients leave upset about something. You know, a lot of doctors get and teams get really mad when a patient complains. But I'll tell you, I'd much rather have a patient complain than not. So retention is 40 to 50% in practices. And you think, well, where are these people going? Well, I guarantee you, it's because something happened in the practice. No one followed up. Mm. They complained and no, and it just went, no one listened. Mm. So for the doctors, Practice owners listening right now, one of the first things 
dealing with customer service you need to teach your team members is to keep their ears open for upsets. Mm. Patients walking out of hygiene saying, oh, I'm sore. She was a little rough. Oh, what was that? Mm. Somebody <laughs> needs to handle that, right? You got to appoint someone to follow up and make sure the verbal skills when people hear those kinds of things. And questioning or getting the hygienist to come back out and explain she hasn't been in for three years. And that's why she's a little sore. And maybe the verbal skills before she left, this is how you learn, like the hygienist needs to handle if somebody hasn't been in for years. And now she did a, so deep cleaning, like you might be sore telling them in advance, right? It prevents yes. upsets later. Staff not following up with promises made to, to patients. Um, a patient complaining that insurance didn't pay and the, and the team member not knowing how to handle that and maybe even hanging up on the patient. I've had that. That's gotten, you know, with, I've had that happen because they didn't know what to say. Yeah. So all of these things is part of when we talked earlier about having the winning team. You never stop learning ever. That's, mm -hmm. that's a huge problem when people think they already know it all. You never stop learning. You never stop practicing. The best teams always practice. So that brings me to the, the team meeting that should be happening at least one a month. When we start working with practices, we'll tell them, well, I'll tell you maybe two team meetings every month at first because there's so much to talk about and train on. Or one, just so it's at least an hour and a half. And the reason why a lot of dentists do not have team meetings is they don't know what to do in the team meeting. <laughs> like they don't have time. And I understand that they don't have time to say, okay, I've got an hour and a half. We're going to block off some time on the schedule. I'm going to feed them lunch. What are we going to talk about? So <laughs> that's why some of these things that you're building up and the articles that you read and cut and post on, on dental win-win Facebook groups that was really good can be printed out and put, somewhere so that you always every person listening I have this and every person listening should go and get a binder I'd say a three inch binder and everything that you ever read on public relations you see an article it gets cut out you get it and now you have a public relations manual and every new person that comes in reads that so that you're constantly bringing that idea of customer service to your team and it can't happen. You can't sit somebody down for two hours and now all of a sudden they're good at customer service. You got to hire people with some customer service DNA. Okay. Yeah. First, and then you've got to train and practice and role play. Got it. And the doctors should be do doing the post-op course at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. And that's nothing new. I mean, we've been yeah. doing those for 30 something years. That is like, and it's a must in every practice that I've known that has gets like 30, 40, 50, 60 new patients every month with no marketing. They are doing that. And yes. they have done that. Yes. Last, last month, I think we got 74 new patients and we didn't, we didn't uh, spend a lot of money on marketing at all. It's, it's mainly from Google and internal referral. And yesterday I did a post up call and this patient asked about braces, clear correct. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I can give you a quote. Yeah. I can give, like, yeah, Jennifer in the front to, uh, to give you a call and give you a quote. It's, it's, it's great. And some patients said, I, I, love, I love you guys. And that's when I say, hey, refer some patients to our practice. Uh, leave a review as well. <laughs> right. So, that's yeah. excellent. Well, good. That's, that's really yeah. good. Yeah. And I, I know wow. part of the, Part of the systems and, and, and in order to have a successful day in a practice, we need to have a morning hurdle as well, right? So can you uh, talk a little bit about morning the morning hurdles hurdle? are important. Yeah. Um, well, I'll tell you, you know, it's kind of funny, like morning huddles, in a, what are they about? If you're really, really organized, you yeah. don't need morning huddles. I, I, let mm. me explain that. Mm. If you've got systems, and everybody knows what they're doing. What is a morning huddle for? Okay, a morning huddle is to make sure that everybody in some practices, oh, you've got a patient coming in that doctor and you need to check over there, number 29, need, she said is a little sensitive. You know, 
But if you have a system for that, you don't have to go over all that. So our practices, people we've worked with for a, a while that are now organized, we start, of course, we teach morning huddle. We have a beautiful yeah. morning huddle agenda, but our morning huddle agenda is going to talk about other things that are bigger, a bigger game, because rather than, you know, the little things that everybody should already know, does that make sense? Because if yes. you're, if you're, if you're organized and everybody's like singing the same tunes, you don't have to micromanage every patient. Okay. But I'll tell you that um, I think that there should be some sort of huddle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of them I think um, are, are a waste of time because it should be things that everybody already knows. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh -huh. Like, like you, they should be able to see new patients coming in and there should be good notes in the computer. And so you don't have to, micromanage every thought that employee has. So, you know, some of the best morning huddles that I've seen, and I'm talking about two and $3 million solo practices, you know, those guys, that's who you should learn from. You know, those guys, they're doing it. That I always like somebody say they're doing 3 million solo. I'm like, yeah, what's happening over there? See that? Yeah. They're doing something right. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> what are they doing? Okay. So they're not micromanaging every step. And so, but they're talking about the bigger picture. So how'd we do yesterday? How many broken appointments did we have? Who were they? What were their balance? You ever notice that people break appointments and have a balance or bad credit? You know, that's yes. a whole nother thing that I talk about, but it's like, you know, where was the system for that? So that morning huddle? Yes. And I, I like it in a larger practice when you have like 15 more staff that, that not everybody comes because you got to have somebody checking in the patients and answering the phones and get representatives like team leaders from each area to come in there. Yeah. And that works really well. Yes. It, it's all about having the systems so that people know everything. There's no surprises or very few surprises. I always would say, you know, like a really organized practice could literally just go out in the parking lot and, and practice right out there without even asking a question. You, know, you can't even hear anything in these organized practices. You can hear a pin drop because everybody knows they're not going to each other and asking each other's questions during the day. They, mm. they just know what's, what to do because they're truly organized. Yes. So, uh, are, are you saying that they, uh, they, uh, most of those uh, successful practices, uh, don't need a bonus system to motivate their team members. <laughs> <laughs> I I didn't have a bonus system working in the practice where I worked. Yeah. Yeah. Now I got a bonus. Yeah. But we didn't have a <laughs> bonus system because the people got that it. didn't work as hard as me didn't get a bonus, which only motivated me more. Does yes. that make sense? Yes, it makes so sense. I, I'm not going to say that I'm against bonus systems. Yeah. Because... I have clients that have bonus systems, then they're successful with them. So I would never frown on a bonus system. I just don't think, I just think you should pay people a fair wage. And, um, and if I'm working in a practice and I'm an employee, that's what I'm getting the paycheck for. Yeah. You know, that's, that's why I get a, a paycheck. I was hired because that dentist needed me to answer the phone and to work at the front office or whatever it is. Now at the end of the year, if I'm doing a really good job, you know, a nice Christmas bonus would be great. Right. That's how we did it. And it was really, I, I just know that very few practices, if they start a bonus and you ask them about it five years later, it's not always still there. In fact, most of the time it's not. So I have, you know, but I'm all about rewarding the team. Yeah. Yeah. Taking surprise lunches, pizza parties, nice uh, family outings. I think that is, you, you need to do that with your team. Absolutely. Got it. Yeah. We didn't learn that until uh, years into the, into the practice after this, uh, this incident with this assistant, basically she got $500, right? And and next month she got another five hundred dollars, so it's it's not it's nothing more, right? Over over time they yeah. become immune to it, and if we give them less, they get disappointed. So uh, well, yeah. 
you know, you say that, but I'll tell you, I've had doctors call me several times. This has happened where the team member is getting bonuses, but the doctor's not getting a paycheck. Mm, yeah. That's bad. What's wrong? Something's not yeah. right here. Last questions. If you were to think of all the strategies that you teach to Dennis, what are the two or three things that you, sh that you think Dennis should start today? <laughs> Well, the first thing they should do is make sure that they actually appointed someone to be in charge of their schedule, their schedule. Like if, if they have one person up front, make sure you told that person that they're the manager of the schedule. And someone, if you've got two people up front, one needs to be the more senior over the schedule. And you have to communicate that. You're in charge of the schedule. That's one thing people don't do. And then they wonder why they're, they're not collecting. Now, here's another thing. You got to tell your team what you need. Like how many times doctors say, Sandy, our, our production this month was 70,000. And then last month it was 50. And then it jumped up to 90. Well, I know exactly what happened. Do you have a goal? Well, I don't know. I think we do. Do we have a goal? Well, maybe not. Do you know that I was lecturing at the townie meeting this past year? And there must have been 60 something people in the room. And I said, who in here is in charge of the schedule? Do you know not one person raised their hand? And then one girl went, <laughs> I said, are you not sure? She said, I think I am. Yeah. So that, that's not good. So how can you have a scheduler that you assign to be in charge of the schedule, but you never told her what you needed? That makes no sense. No wonder you didn't get it, yeah. right? So the first thing I would do if I were working in a dental practice and the doctor hired me to be the scheduler, I'd say, doctor, how much production would you like in a day? That'd yeah. be my, my first thing. And then the doctor would tell me, and so a lot of times practices are like, well, I don't know how to set a goal. I'd like to do a million, but they're doing 550 now, right? So, you know, that's, they have to find out what they're doing now and they have to average it and they have to bump it up. And then that's the goal. And then they have to tell the front office person that's in charge of the schedule and she needs to be able to say it till it just comes off her tongue. She knows it as fast as she knows her name. And I'm not kidding. What's the target for, for doctor? 5,450. What's the target for this hygienist? 1,210. She knows it like this. Because if she mm. doesn't, she'll knit. If you get there, it's by good luck. It's just by yeah. luck. And I don't believe yeah. in luck like that. So yeah. I believe in being proactive. Because the predictability, I like predictability. So that. You know, if they need to appoint a scheduler, they need to find out what they're producing now and bump it up about 15 to 20% by the day, the daily goal, communicate it. Doctors will say, but Sandy, I don't want my, my staff to know what I'm producing. Uh, <laughs> well, I think they can add. Okay. They know what you're producing. They do know. And that's ridiculous. So that's part of, of educating them that, that, you know, you have to pay them and there's a lot of things that need to be paid. So you definitely want them to do that. So the next thing is that they have to focus on retention, 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 retention. You know, I was driving home from work the other day and I never quit thinking about practices. Right. So I'm driving home from work and I'm like, what is there like 165,000 dentists in the United States? Well, some get 50 new patients a month, some get 100, some get five. Some, let's just say we averaged all the new patients from the 165,000 dentists in the United States, and it would equal 10 new patients a month, which I'm sure it's, the average is more than that, but I'm just in my mind driving home. I'm thinking, that's a lot of people changing dentists every month. Think about yeah. that. The, yeah. The patients walking in your door this month, they were in somebody else's chair two years ago. God, 
what are we doing in these practices to run these patients off? Mm, What's yes. happening? Yes. Something's got to give. So that's my passion to retention. Yes. I mean, systems, I'm, we're known for systems and organizations. Um, we have, I don't even know how many pages, more than 3,000, maybe 5,000 pages that we've written of practice management tools. Just our financial coordinator book is 550 pages. Yeah. So, I, I mean, it might be 5,000 pages. I, I'm just <laughs> guessing here. And uh, it takes a you long time. I, yeah, I, I got I to gotta ask you a few more questions here. You're so resourceful. So, <laughs> you know, sure. there are fee-for-service uh, practice owners out there, and there are PPO uh, practice owners, right? And the fee-for-service think that the PPO practice owners are crazy, and the PPO practice owner right. think the fee-for-service practice, uh, practices are, are crazy. So what, what is your take on that? If, you, if your clients uh, are uh, PPO uh, in PPO practices, do you advise them to move toward a fee-for-service and vice versa? Mm -mm. No. No. We can make both work. We can make both work. Just think of the missed opportunities in every practice. They're huge. They're huge. Every practice. I don't care who you are or where you are. You're sitting on 20% right now. To get a practice up 20% is so easy because of missed <laughs> opportunities. So I don't care what type of practice you are. There's always ways to improve. And I'm not going to judge because I have very successful clients in both of those categories. Got it. Absolutely. There's so much to, to realizing and, and training the teams that what happens within your own four walls will deter determine your success or the lack of it. Got yep. it. That's a secret sauce right there. <laughs> yeah. That, that, those are my words. Those are, <laughs> those are yeah. I mean, um, I realized that just from my experience and seeing practices struggling right next to a practice that was booming. Yeah. You know, uh, this, uh, this, this podcast, I know a lot of new practice owners and even the struggling dentists going to learn so much because in dental school, they don't teach us about business management or, or marketing. So when we get out, most of us think that, you know, when we open an office, patient going to show up and then we're going to provide dental care for them. And then we probably need to hire a front desk and assistant. And that's pretty much yeah. it, right? But but yeah. if we were to uh, focus on the business aspect of the of the practice and develop the system, uh, the leadership that we need, mm -hmm. and build a team, yeah. then that that will uh, that will bring success, in my opinion. That's right. Right. That's or, right. It, uh, yeah. Whenever I I lecture at the LSU, they'll have me over there every once in a while, and for alumni day, I was their keynote. Believe me, when I'm going to the car, those guys are following me. And girls <laughs> following me to my car. I mean, I'm standing yeah. there with my keys and my yeah. purse, and they're, can I ask you something else? Can I ask you? And I love that. I love it. Yeah. Uh, that, that's awesome. Especially uh, these days, the, the school debt is, is, is so high, and, and it, costs, mm -hmm. it costs so much to, to start a practice, and you cannot make a mistake at all. In the old days, uh, this, uh, there's a lot more room to make mistakes and still, uh, still do great, right? But Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, that's right. And you, you you can, it's all about time too. It's like not, yeah. not making the mistakes because it becomes those missed opportunities. Yes. So oh, great. So uh, before we go, uh, I'm going to ask you uh, my favorite questions and that is what makes you happy in life? Oh, my family, my husband and my, my daughter and my grandbabies and my son-in-law and my dog, Molly. Yeah. It's all about family. Family is really important to me. Yeah. And helping dentists, of course. That's why you see me in your group at 10 and 11 o'clock at night. Yes. yes. <laughs> because Thank you I so much. Yeah. Other than the Facebook group, if uh, people want to get in touch with you, how, how can they contact you, uh, Sandy? Oh, they can call me uh, here at the office. Uh, our website is classicpractice.com and uh, all the information is right there. Or my email is Sandy and that's with a Y at classicpractice.com.
Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Sandy. Uh, thank you for your time and all the great advice that you share in this interview. I was really happy uh, to come on and, and do this with you. That was fun. And I want to let the, the listeners know I give seminars. I have seminars here and in New Orleans, and uh, they can go on our website and learn more about that. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I also appreciate everyone for watching this Coffee Break interview video podcast with me and Sandy Pardue. Until next time, take care.